welcome back to the channel. I know you've been waiting. I know you've been excited. I know you've been wondering what's he going to talk about now because if it's going to be something interesting, I want to see it. So welcome back. Here we are. Uh, first, as always, let me introduce myself for those who don't know me. Hello, I am Lewis Porter Jr. And today we're going to talk about something that kind of came up in the thought process of my mind while working on some personal projects that I had to wonder about for other folks in the publishing field of games and comics and stuff like that. But this is more games, role-playing games specifically, but it also touches video games, as you'll see in a second. So here's the question. If organized play is the best way for third-party publishers to make money and gain fans, then why don't more companies do it? Now, it sounds kind of like, well, that's, I don't know, I've never heard of organized play. Well, probably you have. If you've been involved with D&D at any time forever, there's been a thing specifically called organized play or living campaigns, same kind of thing. This has been going around since I can remember in gaming, so we're talking 40 years easily. And, you know, the RPGA was a organization that did this. It was really the marketing arm for Dungeons and Dragons under TSR to get people interested in playing their games. This is also spun off into video games. A lot of your online play that you see is basically a direct, I'd say, relative of creation from living and organized play. At its core, it's getting people together to play your game. The more people that play, the more popular it becomes. It's really not that complex, and it makes a lot of sense. But not many companies do it. Well, specifically, we're going to talk about D&D &D right now. It makes it a little bit easier so I can put it in some context. D&D &D was the first ones to really do it and do it very well. And when 3.5 came out... There was organized play evolved for 3.0, 3.5, sorry. I, said, I, just say, I just say OGL will cover all the bases. When it came out in the early 2000s, there weren't any third-party guys doing it. And the only third-party guys that I knew that did it well, and I happen to know these guys well enough that I can talk about them in a nice, friendly way, is Paradigm Concepts. Now, Paradigm Concepts is, or was, well, still is, since they do publish, is a third-party publisher. They've done a lot of games, but back in the olden days, in the early 2000s, they were making material for Dungeons & Dragons. They built a living, organized play called Living Arcanus, and Arcanus, which was their campaign world, and it was a brilliant, simple idea. And while talking to the guys who getting information about like how they did it, because I was always fascinated by it, because to me it seems like the purpose for living, any living campaign, any of them, was to build that fan base. And once you get that fan base fervored up for your products, oh, they buy. And I don't mean like they buy kinda. I mean they buy like wild animals. If you look at Dungeons & Dragons as a prime example, when they put out product that's connected to their organized play, that product sells like crazy. And the same thing would happen with third party. And the part that was even weirder to me that I didn't understand, I'm still, even to this, this day, 20 years after understanding it, seeing it, I'm still getting to wrap my head around it, is how passionate that fan base is. See, the people playing organized play are the rabidest of fans. They will buy and play adventures because they want to play. They like it. They like to get stuff. Their characters get stuff over time. They have certain things. And you can look in their character sheet and what they've done. And they keep playing and playing and playing. That builds your base of people that you can call your rabid fans that are buying your products because they like the game and they like how to play it, so they buy the products corresponding. What Arcanus did, what I thought was kind of brilliant, and looking when you compare it to other organized play, Arcanus made a connection by storyline. They built storyline in their in their adventures. No, D and D just did adventures. That's an adventure, boom, fire and forget. You know, an adventure, an adventure, adventure. No story arc, no continuing story, no beginning, middle, end. The guys at Paradigm Concepts did that, and it was a brilliant idea. And even more so, I think that every smart company should do that. I think other every smart company now in this day and age does do that. So, and I'm still talking, you know, back in the past, but it's always on a good perspective. It's kind of smart to imagine what kind of effect this would have on your sales. And, you know, there are people who were playing D&D back then. They wanted something new. They played D&D for years. Here's Arcanus. Oh, that's cool. I really enjoy it. Oh, they've got organized play. Well, I like organized play. Let me see if it works. Oh, my God. It works very much like the one I've been playing for years. No problem. Oh, my God. There's a storyline to this. And talking to the guys over there, I think that was one of the small, like, brilliant ideas they came up with was, was telling a good story. 
and what they told me, which I totally, 110% believe is right. Your actions in the game should affect the storyline. It should. There is, well, there should be a direct connection to that. If your characters did A, then B should happen. Positive or negative? You know, but let's take a fantasy setting. Let's, you know, you, you're trying to save the princess from the castle. Well, you get to the castle and you face the big dragon, but you don't get the princess. Well, if you don't get the princess, it's going to affect us in the future. But if you do get the princess, it changes it. And that's where you have to, there has to be choice. There has to be, this could happen or this could happen. And either one has a different effect on the story. And you keep telling that kind of story. And for my own purely 100%, desire i've always wanted to do organized play i think it's brilliant i've been working very hard to get that done i think a storyline can be done and i'll say it without any kind of hesitation mutants and masterminds being a superhero game is built for that because let's be honest comic books are built for long-term play oh well, sorry long-term reading of a storyline that fits in very much and would fit in very much with play and it makes a lot of sense so i think that Certain genres are built for that. Com you know, combo superhero ones are perfect for it. That's why I want to do it. We're working ours right now. It's starting out very small. We're trying to build a story that connects all of our adventures together. And then later on, we're going to make some changes. But like the first year, the first year, what, what I have planned is we're doing six adventures. They're all interconnected and they all continue from the next one. And the way I've looked at it and designing it, I'm kind of designing it best way like a comic book. Every adventure you play is kind of like two comic books. Let me see how crazy this will be. Say I just grab, oh, okay, I grab these. Well, these aren't in order. That's what happens when you buy comic books. Just at random. I have some other ones down here. But, so, pose. Let's see. Can you see? Can you see? People are like, why do you have Earth 2? But I just, I like the book. I bought them 10 cents a piece. I couldn't pass them up. Why not? So, you tell a story. It's like two issues. These two issues, boom, boom. This is the adventure. That's it. That's how you break down adventures. It's like two, two comic books make one adventure. And that's how you run it. And then you do another one, and another one, and the story connects throughout. So now I'm gonna look at my little list here, but I can find something really quick and exciting that you people like. Oh, I get it. You know, oh, well, that's kind of cool. I bought a lot. You know, it's really great. You can buy stuff for ten cents. I mean, yes, I wanted to read it. I think it's an interesting story. Yes, I wanted to read it. I've already read it. You know, and at ten cents, how do you beat it? People, some people are like, this, you got those for ten cents? I got these for ten cents. Some people are mad too. They're like, you got that for 10 cents? I think this came out. Yeah, it just came out, but I got it for 10 cents. We got a store that wants to get rid of product. Always oh, buy it at 10 cents. It's always a good price. But I digress. So I think adventure should be like that. There are two issues of comic book. If you do a six part adventure that's interconnected, you've got a whole year, quote unquote, of story as it would be in a comic book. So boom, one year. And you collect that and you make a trade paperback. And you basically, or an omnibus, you can even call it omnibus, but, or you just call it Adventure Path. But I think Adventure Path might be copywritten by a certain company that I will be talking about. But you make an Adventure Path that people connect this big story. And then year, the next year, or year two, as I would say, you tell another story. And maybe you connect back to some of the events that happened in the first year. And then you go to year three and year four. And that's how you keep building it. You keep building it over time, over time, over time. And that's something that really isn't done in the third party room. Now, I don't know why they don't do it. Well, I do know why. You gotta find someone who's willing to write adventures. And you gotta get someone who's gonna write a lot of adventures. Because the other part that I didn't understand about organized play was that when I told you the fan base was rabid about playing it, well, my buddies over at Paradigm Compsets would tell me, yeah, we could release like six adventures. And within like, you know, a weekend or two weekends, they'll blow through all six. And they'll be screaming, more, more, I want more, more, more. And it's like, holy cow. So the good news, bad news is, is that once you do these adventures and they get popular, they're going to go through them like a hot knife through butter. You can get this fan base so rabid, you can't, you maybe not be able to feed their need. So that's another part to it. And I think that's something else that has to work on. Like how many adventures do you need to make? How much stuff needs to come out? For me, I thought back a long time ago, this is how I would market it. So you can use this for yourself. You can steal this idea. If you steal this idea, have the common decency to say that I was the one who thought of it for you guys and you stole it, but you thought it was a good idea. 
So what I thought would be a perfect way to do this would be run a year of your adventure for your organized play to run from Gen Con, which is usually August, well, July, August, later in the summer, all the way through the rest of the year to Christmas at Winter Fantasy, or around Winter Fantasy would be played for for Watsy. We'll just say Watsy. That would be your mid-year point. And you play all the way to the end to Origins. And that would be your end point. So you've got the beginning, the middle, and the end. Now, the real reason that I have it go that way, a lot of people are like, why don't you just play it from Origins to Gen Con? This is why. If you get people who play, like I suggested, once you get to Origins, between Origins and Gen Con, you have about six weeks. During that six weeks, and you know, you've said you been working on this, so you know what the end is going to be, the big end goal. If you set the ending up in a way that could be really, really cool, you can tell what the start for the next year will be. And remember, that's six weeks apart. So people will play at, they'll play at Origins. It'll be the big event. It'll be a Battle Interactive. That's whatever that might call you. I guess I have to find some of these things. So a Battle Interactive is a very large scale, larger than life adventure. I'm going to describe a Battle Interactive like this. If I was doing a superhero setup, my version would be this. I'm going to go back old school. So the first part would set up would be, in fact, we'd have these villains attack the heroes. Just at random. So random villains, you don't know who they are. They're all new. No, no, no. By the middle of the year, you find out these villains are coming from this source for this person who keeps sending them after the heroes. And you, you still don't know the why. At the end of it, you have this large battle interactive. The Battle Interactive in comic book terms would be like Marvel Comics' first Secret Wars. They go off planet, they have this big adventure, it's all there, it's very special, it's different, it has all these people involved, there's all this stuff going on, it's big and it's huge and it's it's Secret Wars. It was big, it was huge, it was supposed to be. Ta-da! Then, the little gap, as I'm leaving, and then have them come back. When they come back, things have changed, just like in the, in the Battle Interactive. You started the Battle Interactive, you did it, that's the end of the year. Ta-da! You're now starting back at Gen Con. Now it's a new year. Things that have happened over here affect what's happening here. Spider-Man got a new black costume. Ooh, what effect did that have? We got Venom out of that. The thing could transform back from, from being Ben Grimm to his human form. What effect did that have? The She-Hulk joins the Fantastic Four. What effect did that have? There's ways to do this. You can connect storylines and you can make it like that. And that's kind of the cool bridge. And you still get the adventures at the cons. Now, here's where it gets even more interesting. If you do this right, you can tie in your adventures to stores and location. For example, something that Watsi, was it Watsi or TSR did is that they had regional places where adventures were played. Well, you could do that same thing. You pick out, carve out sections of the United States. I'm talking about US, but it's easy and I know the US, so don't complain they're national fans. You carve out certain areas and you call it this place. Like this is, I don't know. You know, this is Metropolis. This is Gotham. This is Star Coast. This is, the, and there's certain adventures. Well, there might be a big overall store that connects everything. But maybe in certain locations, you have certain adventures you can only play there. You can only place an adventure here to get credit to do this. What does that do? Well, if you're smart, you can go to game stores and say, hey, we have this adventure. We, we give away to our fan base. They have them come to your store and play. Could you carry our line of products that when people play, they can buy your products and buy from you? Oh, they would love that. Because what you're doing is you're bringing them customers. Having people play for free doesn't doesn't help them. Bringing them paying customers that can buy your stuff from your store, that helps them. And that's really what Dungeons Dragons has done. They built organized play so people can buy books in the stores. And that's what you should be doing. That's the exact same thing. You should be doing an organized play with a long-term goal of getting a product into the store. If you do it really well, you can maybe sell direct to these guys. If you do it super well, you build products just for very specific stores that they can only get in those specific stores. A lot of you are like, well, why would I do that? Because certain things that are regional become more valuable and more interesting. If you got a place, if let's, say, let's just say, okay, I'll t since I live in South Florida, if you could, if, and there's a couple, there's a couple comic book stores here. And gaming stores, but you know what I mean. But if you could only get this one adventure of playing at this one store, and this one adventure had this one item that you could only get from there, would you go there to play? Well, of course you would, because that's what people play. They want, I want to get the cool thing. I want to get the cool cert. This cool cert is only available at this store. You've got to play at this store to get this cert. If you don't play at this store to get this cert, 
You can't get it. Sorry, can't get it. No way. And people are like, wait, wait, it's, uh, wait. I meant, oh, wait. Yeah, they do a lot of that. But they're going to go to that store and play there because they want the special cert. They want the special thing. They want the special thing for their character. They want the unique thing. So when they go to Gen Con or Origins or Winter Fantasy, they want to be able to pull a cool thing out saying, ooh, I got this and I played it in such and such. And everybody goes, ooh, wow, I've never seen that before. You want that. You want that effect. And organized play does that. My other feeling about it, I think video game companies have mastered how to do that. Um, one of my favorite, Destiny. Well, I can't play because I get motion sickness. That's right. I play certain action games, I get motion sickness. Please stop laughing. But I love their marketing. So I'm all about the marketing. I'm always looking at the marketing, seeing what they do. They do seasonal events. Same exact thing. Seasonal events are important. You can only get the stuff here at the seasonal event. The exact same thing can be done in the tabletop community. Valentine's Day can have an event. You know, it has one for it has one for Destiny. Christmas can have an event. It has one for Overwatch. Summer can have an event. I know Overwatch does their summer games. So you could pick holidays. Some maybe national, some regional, whatever. Halloween. Overwatch does one for Halloween. Same exact thing. You don't have to be super creative about this. You can copy what they do and just bring it over to your tabletop game. But just get the adventures out there. And that's the biggest problem. Get the adventures out. you got to find a way to get the adventures out that people can play them and get excited about them. Once you do that and you get someone to write them on a regular basis, you could take over the industry. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are like, oh, that's not, it's not that easy. No, it's not that easy. But the hardest part is getting the adventures out. Like I told you before, Paradigm Concepts said those people ate up adventures like pancakes. You just got to figure out a way to make the most pancakes you can for a reasonable price and make money off it. And even better still, get people to play the game and then buy your stuff. Got to make the connections. You got to make the connections. Got to make those connections. That's just something I would do. Or more importantly, that's what I'm doing right now. But I'm trying to find a way I can do it as fast as possible to get as many people involved so we can be the great supplement to the great game that people play. If you play Mutant and Masterminds, you want to play in our organized play. Because you know it's going to be cool. And any company that's not doing this really should think about it. Because, let's be honest, if you're going to do adventures, why not tell a connected story where you can make money on? I mean, let's just think about it for a second. Let's take a second and think. What company created... Oh, I can't really say created... Or built an empire off to telling a connected story over 22 movies. Hmm. How did that turn out for them? Yeah, I'm guessing pretty good. So, if it works for them, why can't you try it on a smaller scale for your tabletop game? I mean, this ain't rocket science. If it's a good idea, you should copy it. Because I know I'm going to. And... If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I have a feeling it's going to work a lot better than I ever thought. Because someone's going to look at that and go, Oh, that's a great idea. I would love to play in a game with my character doing such and such. Just something to think about. Thank you so much for stopping by, and I will talk to you all later. Hey, thank you for checking out my channel. Do me a favor, check out my other videos, and if you like what you see, subscribe.